On Tuesday the 5th of May 1992, the body of an 18.7 metre long whale washed ashore at Cathedral Rock near Lawn on Victoria's spectacular southern coast. As the tail tossed backwards and forwards in the surf, it created the impression that the whale might still be alive. But sadly, that was not the case. This unusual event offered Museum Victoria a rare chance to acquire the remains of one of the largest animal species that has ever lived on Earth, for this was a blue whale. For the onlookers, it was an experience they'll never forget. The whale was bloated with gases that normally build up during tissue breakdown, and many of the workers worried that the grotesquely distended body might actually burst. Fortunately, the whale washed ashore right beside the Great Ocean Road. But even so, getting the body off the beach was tricky, and there's no instruction manual. The process of retrieval required bulldozers to move the 40-tonne body up the beach, cranes to raise it to the Great Ocean Road, and a powerful low loader to transport it to a suitable site for the post-mortem. With great skill, the bulldozer and crane drivers loaded their most unusual cargo ever onto the truck. The body of the whale was laid out at Melbourne Water's sewage treatment plant at Werribee, a location chosen partly because it was felt the whale's own peculiar aroma might be less obvious there. This was a post-mortem with a difference. No stainless steel bench, no green-suited pathologist, but the aim was just the same, to establish the cause of death. For these vets, up to their waists in decaying whale, the experience was obviously unpleasant, but it was also worthwhile. The vets couldn't establish the cause of death. The whale's various organs and tissues were free of obvious disease and parasites. They did notice, however, that the layer of blubber was thinner than it should have been, suggesting the animal was malnourished. Some weeks later, when Melbourne Water held an open day at Werribee, 6,000 people braved a bleak afternoon to get a close-up view of the only blue whale most of them will ever see. Surprisingly, many visitors were unaware that this type of whale has no teeth. Instead, its upper jaws are lined with what look like bristly old brooms. And as it takes in water rich in krill, it then pushes the water back out through its mouth and the krill get caught on the fringed hairs on the inside of the baleen. Some visitors did have their reservations. I think it sticks. <laughs> For Jim Cousin's son, the legacy of his father's weeks of patient work, waist deep in dead whale, was all too obvious. How long is my dad going to stink for? In order to help remove flesh from the bones, the preparators decided to enlist nature's help. What better than the bacteria in a sewage treatment pond to speed the process along? Nature also lent a helping hand when the skull was left out to weather in the sun. It may seem grisly to us, but for this baby rat, the inner sanctum of the whale's brain case was the perfect housing estate, with food laid on. For the museum's preparators, accustomed to dealing with everything from pied geese to platypus, the major problem posed by the whale was its sheer size. Everything from the degreasing facility to the assembly area had to be large enough to accommodate the massive bones. Eight years after the whale's death, the skeleton was assembled for the first time. With the skull mounted on the glass plinth, the curving spine held aloft on stainless steel supports, visitors had their first glimpse of this splendid exhibit. Within Melbourne Museum's vast galleria, the organic shapes of the bones complemented the sleek angularity of the museum's architecture, each in its own way a lesson in form and function. 
More than merely the remains of a dead whale, the bones are a poignant reminder of the wonderful creatures that roam free in our southern oceans.